Mm -hmm. And also I'm going to ask you right now before I forget to mute. And you'll come back on when um, when you want to say something to Shelly when there's Q and A later. So, getting back to what I where where I was. Thank you, friends, for your support, and it is because of you that we are able to have Shelly and Bacha and and everybody else that uh, you know that that um, who comes and speaks to us, and we are very lucky to have so many wonderful supporters. If you are here tonight as a guest or it's your first time, we welcome you and hope that you will also become a friend. As Jackie says, $10 a year, it's the biggest bargain in town, and I quote her all the time because it really is. You couldn't have one thing, one let one inter interaction with Shelly for ten dollars. So, um, please join us. We're doing something very right. We have well over 500 active friends of the library. So, join us, and we would love to have you. I hope everybody is getting their newsletters. And if you're not, make sure you let us know so that you will make get them again. Um, I would like to just point out to you that on the 6th of April, which is a week, a uh, Sunday, this Sunday is Easter. So happy Easter to everybody who celebrates Easter. And uh, the next Sunday will be our book fair. So put that on your calendar and come in. We have lots of books and um, it's, it's really $3.00 a bag if you're a friend, five if you're not, and um, again, another bargain. So please join us on your um, newsletter. Just notice that Candy's movie is going to be on Monday the 1st, and it's going to be The Call of the Wild. It's an updated version of the Jack London story. So I remember Spitz and Buck. I can't believe I remember that from like all those years ago. And um, and then also Bacha on Mon on Tuesday evening is starting a new series about um, interaction with the East and the West Asia and, and should be very interesting as well. And so on and so forth. Check your newsletter. Enjoy all of our program. Thanks you for coming. And Shelly, I am so excited about tonight's program. As I said to Shelley before, I saw it and I watched it. I actually did it twice, which I don't usually do, but it was fascinating. And he has a lot to tell us and I can't wait to hear it. So Shelley, thank you for being with us, for being so great with us. And, and we love you and I hope you love us as much <laughs> and take it away. And I need to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, yes, I have a lot to, as we say, unpack tonight. I mean, there's a lot of research that was done for the film that I'll talk about, uh, about the director herself, what she did, and uh, some of the things that I found out. And uh, some of the things I will even mention towards the end that hopefully you saw in the film. Anyway, Cezanne and I is from 2016, Cezanne and moi, and it was directed and written by Danielle Thompson, uh, who is both a screenwriter and director since the 60s. She's been nominated for Best Screenplay Oscar 1977 for her film Cousin Cousine, uh, and she both, uh, for which she both wrote and directed, as well as uh, in uh, later, a few years ago, she was uh, wrote and directed a film uh, in 2007 called Avenue Montaigne, uh, which uh, was also known as Orchestra Seats. And uh, she received an Oscar, uh, she was submitted for an Oscar for that. Anyway, getting to Cezanne and moi is a richly detailed, deeply researched work, which Danielle Thompson worked on for a number of years. She began working on it in the early 2000s. What inspired and intrigued her was how these two young boys, 
who met in a religious school in what was a faraway province in X, would become two of the most important figures in the 19th century. She steeped herself in Zola's original writings through Zola's editor, editor's great-grandson, his editor's great-grandson, and Zola's great-granddaughter, whom she met and worked with. They supplied a great deal of help in the way of letters between Zola and Cezanne. In fact, she said some of them read almost like love letters. They were so, uh, the early ones, the later ones get a little testy. And she intensely studied Cezanne's painting and his life. She did a tremendous amount of reading on both. An interesting side story that I discovered was that Daniel Thompson had spoken to Mike Nichols, the director, about a year before his death. She asked what he thought about her doing a play about Cezanne et moi, about making it into a play. His response, she said, thankfully, was don't lock yourself on a stage. She follows advice and uh, saying that Cezanne, to, to really appreciate Cezanne, you have to be outdoors. Uh, so she attributed him with inspiring her to make it into a film. The story has many levels. It is a bromance between two childhood friends trying to remain friends. They once were, but no longer are in the context of the film. Young men on the way to becoming something, men in their intimacy, in their daily lives, which were anything but remarkable at that time. They weren't legends, they weren't icons, just young men with friends, problems, dreams, weaknesses, and hopes. Two artists obsessed with work and their work would take precedence over everything else in their lives. While the film takes some creative liberties with the historical facts of their relationship, it remains largely faithful to the spirit of their friendship and the historical context in which it developed. The film explores the complex dynamics of the relationship between Zezan and Sola, uh, you know, who had remained close and we watch how it deteriorates over their artistic differences as well as their personal intimate conflicts. Uh, the film portrays Cezanne as a passionate and gifted artist who struggled to gain recognition for his work. While at the same time, he expressed himself with anger, insulting everyone and anyone close to him or in his vicinity. While Zola depicted, was depicted as, is depicted as a driven and ambitious writer who became a leading figure in the French literary world. In fact, Cezanne's mental condition, and this is an aside, was posthumously diagnosed with a variety of disorders, including bipolar disorder, uh, attributing to his mood swings and his obsession with death that can, can be seen in many of his works. Danielle Thompson learned he was a very difficult man. He didn't wash. He didn't care how he looked or smelled. He basically lived like a bum and had very little money, even though he grew up with so much. Camille Pizarro's great-grandchildren, the great artist Camille Pizarro's great-grandchildren, have this wonderful information that she talked about. They learned from their grandmother about Cezanne and how when he used to come to dinner at the Pizarro's, the children would hold their noses because he smelled so bad. Uh, this is, you know, a little more insight. The film also provides a rich and detailed portrait of the cultural and artistic establishment of the late 19th of late 19th century France, including the Impressionist art movement and the political and social upheavals of the era. Overall, while Cezanne and moi may take those his liberties with historical facts, uh, it remains a thoughtful and engaging exploration of the complex interplay between art, friendship, and personal ambition in the lives of these two great creative minds. The film begins in their later lives, as we see when Zola is awaiting Cezanne for what would become, but never, never verified, by the way, as their last encounter, something I will speak about later. Then the title appears, revealing symbols of both their lives. We see the camera skirt across Zola's desk. We see uh, paints on a palette, the representation of still lives, 
chemicals, palettes, finally ending with paint being applied to the brush off the palette as if to create this story. And throughout, we flash back and forward through significant moments from their formative years, through success and failure, through marriages and affairs, through confrontations and the eventual rift in their relationship. Cezanne arrives and we see their childhood. The two young boys meeting in 1852, revealed through a montage of a bucolic boyhood, playing in the fields, swimming, an idyllic time of life, almost a Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer kind of story. Emil, the son of poor parents, who become, uh, whose father died as an engineer on a dam being built in X uh, and become eventually becomes a wealthy bourgeois, established and recognized, and Paul, the son of wealthy bourgeois parents who becomes marginalized by his poor bohemian lifestyle. He made nothing from his paintings while he lived, or very little, lived with a woman he would marry until later, and his only obsession was his art. In 1860, when we flash forward, Zola is struggling and supporting his mother, Cezanne fighting with his father, frustrated by not wanting to pursue banking, and he comes to Paris. In one fell swoop, we enter the Café Society of Artists. We see Renoir, Pizarro, Manet, Courbet. Cezanne speaks out against the old school, telling his friends or supposed friends to stop copying and look for the new ways to interpret. This may be imagined, but we are given a glimpse of young men not yet achieving greatness, some who will in their lifetime, and those whose recognition will come after they are long gone. Through the push and pull of time, we see the young artists at the Salon de Refuse, an exhibition of works that were rejected by the jury of the official Paris Salon. It was established by Emperor Napoleon III, and when you think about it, Amazing that it featured works by Renoir, by Cezanne, by Courbet and Pizarro, and most importantly, Manet, whose painting, Les Déjeuners sur l'herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass, sparked a public controversy by portraying scandalous nudity and opened up the world to new aesthetics of art, namely Impressionism, and what would eventually lead to modern art. <clears throat> Cezanne returns to Aix-en-Provence, beginning his deep relationship with the nature of the area. And through letters we hear over, over, the, over the sea, each expresses their friendship and feelings for each other. We see how in 1867, Paul, continuing to delve into what is known as plein air, painting out in nature, and the importance of seeing the true colors of nature, capturing the mood and the feeling of a place. We also see the introduction of two paints. If you remember Pierre Tanguay, who was introduced when we meet all the other painters, he supported many of the artists depicted in the film by buying their works and supplying them with materials. His paints would revolutionize the ability for artists to work outdoors more often, to work outdoors more often. And there's even a funny cap, uh, uh, conversation between Cezanne and Tanguay when he says, but no black. He says, no, no black. There was no black in the paintings. They, that was one of the tenets of their painting. In 1870, the two meet again. Emile is very successful and visits Paul in X, where we see another beautiful montage of the two as if still trying to capture what they once had in their childhood. Paul has had a son, with Hortense, it is during this period that Cezanne first discovers the mountain. If you remember, he looks up and he sees the mountain, Mount Saint-Victoire, which I will discuss later, that would capture his imagination and would eventually transform his art. In 1880, at a dinner party at Emile's mansion, which was actually part of a group of artists and literary greats that included Guy de Maupassant, Paul insists everyone, and, and Paul insults everyone. He insults everybody at the table and even attacks their boyhood friend, Balassan, the young man that was friendly with them at the beginning for being a petty bourgeois. Outside, Emil tells Paul that he still believes in his talent. Paul responding how he'd like to paint the way Emil writes. 
he would like to paint the way Emil writes. Later, as they go back to the house, Paul is outside hearing the other guests insulting him. In fact, this was actually, this actually happened, was recorded. It is part of the book, the masterpiece, which gets discussed at the end. In that book, he actually wrote about this dinner. We feel his heartbreak as Emil's mother comes out to comfort him. And she says, loosen my corset, I have to breathe. And he too, she says to him, you too have to breathe. Uh, when in 1886, we go to 1886, while well, Emil is reading his new book, The Masterpiece, to an audience, Paul stands in the back and without acknowledging himself, leaves. Then the film flashes forward again and the two finally encounter each other over the, that book with Paul accusing Emil of appropriating his life, calling him a rapist. He found the work to be an affront to his very being. He said everything in there is about him, about them. This becomes the main thread of the story. Zola's inspiration was Cezanne, their youth and friendship, their obsessions and discussions. But he also did what novelists do. And this is what he's saying to Cezanne. He's what he does with the truth. He took liberties with their lives, with the art scene, creating situations that weren't entirely true, if at all. <clears throat> and in interviews, Danielle Thompson said, if Zola can do it, so can I, which is what she does with the film. So the, even though the truth is that Cezanne introduced Zola to his wife, uh, you know, we talk about that, it, it, it comes up in the film, it was only rumored that Paul had an affair with her. Uh, so she made it seem real. She injected that into the story. It's not necessarily true. And while the last known letter from Cezanne to, so to Zola in 1886, the one that Zola reads out loud, where Paul thanks him for the book, the director decided to make 1888 the film's central reference point. It was because she saw it as a pivotal year for both artists. Cezanne's father had died, as we learned, which meant that Paul suddenly had inherited money. And a few months before his father's death, Paul finally married Hortense. Meanwhile, 1888 was also the arrival of Jean, the laundry maid, if you remember in the film, the young laundry maid who gave birth to his two children. More on that later. More on that later. So despite what all the historians think, Danielle Thompson had the men meet in 1888 and that Cezanne came to Emile's home in Medan one last time for that last explanation. And then we finally see how from there we jump to Ambrose Vallard, uh, who was a gallery owner, famous in his own right. He arrives in Cezanne's life. He begins buying his paintings. If you remember, he goes into the shack where he painted and he buys up some of the paintings. And he would become Cezanne's champion, bringing his art to America. Ironically, the French and even the Germans, and there is a mention of it in the film, rejected Cezanne's work. They rejected the work. Thankfully, it wound up in America, and it is why so much of his art is in museums here in the States and around the world. That's how his paintings got around the world. And, that, and in that final scene at the end, when Paul is told that Emile is an ex, when he's painting out in nature and his friend um, comes to tell him, he runs to meet him. And it is after the Dreyfus affair, as we learn, where he's brought his Mr. Jean and their two children. Incidentally, uh, well, I'll get into this in a minute. Uh, they and uh, he, but he, and when he's ready to say hello to Zola, someone asks Zola, What about Cezanne? Are you going to see him? And he says, Cezanne, he said, He was a talented man, but he was still born. His talent was still born which said Cezanne, and he walks away dejected. Uh, you know, after he tells the kid that he was a stillborn genius, he returns to his nature in the end, 
with the titles revealing that Zola died in 1902 from smoke inhalation and Cezanne died four years later of pneumonia while he was doing his last painting. I hope that you all watch the end titles. If you tell me no, you have to go back and watch the end titles. Uh, you see, in the end titles, we see a study of the painting that he did. The study of the uh, paintings of Mount saint Victoire. okay? In that few minutes over those titles, that painting changes, it metamorphoses, because all of those that you see are the studies that he actually painted. He did 75, he did, he did something like 30, 30 paintings and 45 pastels that he did of that mountain. Uh, and it takes us in a transition, beginning with Impressionism, it takes us through modern art, cubism, and finally abstractionism. You will see buildings come and go in the paintings. They were all his studies. And finally, it is almost an abstract work by the end, uh, which is why Picasso was quoted in the end titles of saying Cezanne was the father of us all. Cezanne was the father of us all. Uh, the cinematography richly recreated the world of these two great artists. The scenes in Provence were stunning and beautiful. The flowers, the water, the mountain landscapes truly evoked the environment that inspired the painter. In fact, the film was shot exactly where Cezanne painted, outside that actual small house he rented where he spent the nights to catch the light of the sunset and the sundown. They were also, again, through Zola's great-granddaughter, able to shoot in the garden of his home, which today is a museum. It only opened back in 2018. Uh, Zola's house is now a museum. <clears throat> to truly capture the period and the environment of this period, Danielle Thompson used much of the paintings of another artist. He was a lesser known impressionist. His name was Kai Barth. And, but he is today considered, he's been rehabilitated as one of the great impressionists. And the work, uh, his work, inspired for Danielle Thompson, many of the costumes and the scenes that take place by the water when they go on the picnic uh, and you see the women bathing uh, in the nude. This was, this was actually went on. These were, you have to remember, these were not well-known people at the time. They were painters and artists, but they were not well-known and they were lived like, like Bohemians. They would picnic like this. They would drink. They would they would rely on the kindness of others to support them. Anyway, we see this. Event. And Cezanne became more and more careless in how he dressed and took care of himself, as we see in the film. That actually was the truth. The two leads in the film are among France's finest actors. Guillaume Gallien, who plays Cezanne, is a stage actor from the Comédie Française, and here brings this tempestuous character alive, portraying a gamut of moods, from affection to despondency to rag, rag and finally heartbreak. While the director depicts his life as a never-ending struggle against ridicule and rejection, and in spite of his self-pitying and being disgruntled, he relentlessly pursues his artistic ambitions. Nothing would stop him from painting. Guillaume Canet plays Emile Zola as more restrained, even at times repressed in contrast with Cezanne. His character develops from a would-be writer to one of the fathers of naturalism and eventually a celebrity, an immigrant from Italy who succeeds in France fabulously. In fact, he's buried at the Parthenon with Balzac. Um, he, he, his writing would become the basis for many 20th century writers, among them Tom Wolfe, uh, who, who based his writing on Zola's. It is also interesting how Danielle Thompson sees things through a female gaze in the film on this society. We see how artistic ambition and the complicity between male artists shut out intimacy with women, uh, especially Cezanne. We see how Hortense yells at him in the studio as he paints her, as he touches her. She's an object to him. And that's what she says. You're more in love with that painting than you are with me physically. 
Uh, and that's how, how you know, she portrayed, Danielle Thompson portrays it, and apparently was very true. Uh, and how portraiture wasn't purely aesthetic that it could also op objectify, as I said, women's bodies, even be a means of aggression for some artists. What's also fascinating is how the artist's mothers, both major characters in the film, had strong relationships with their sons. They stayed attached to their sons until their deaths. And in an ironic postscript to the film, when Danielle Thompson finished the script, now the script was finished in 2008, but didn't go into production until much later because the film uh, came out in 2016. But in 2008, Dan Danielle Thompson went down to Aix-en-Provence to see the places she had described without having really seen them yet. There she met the curator of Cezanne's last workshop the one he used in his last, the last years of his life and which anyone today can visit. You can go there and you can visit his workshop. He asked her, the, the uh, curator asked her, do you know Cezanne's last letter to Zola? She said, yes, the one all the historians talk about, which we hear about in the film. And he said, no, a letter that was sold at Sotheby's three months ago. This was back in 2000." in 2008, um, um, yes, she said she was reeling. No, I never heard about it. A letter had been sold at Sotheby's for $17,000 three months prior to her trip. A letter from 1887 in which Cezanne thanks Zola for the earth, which was his next novel after the masterpiece. The letter ends with, I am going to come and see you in 1887. A full year after the last known letter, she thought, how extraordinary. My dramatic license suddenly became plausible. What she imagined may really have happened. That said, even if they did see each other, we don't know what they said. So the screenwriter's inspiration necessarily comes into play. Uh, but an imagination that owes a lot, Emil Zola's texts, Cezanne's letters, Zola's responses, various people's testimonies, the memoirs of uh, Ambrose Villard himself, uh, the art dealer who helped establish Cezanne's reputation. It was fascinating to blend it all together, to juggle real life stories with the dialogue, as she said, that I gave them. In following up on the end of the film, Zola died on 29th of September, 1902, of what was reported as carbon monoxide poisoning caused by an improperly ventilated chimney. His funeral on October 5th was attended by thousands of people. In fact, Alfred Dreyfus initially uh, had promised not to attend because he didn't want any trouble at the funeral. But his wife, Zola's widow, had asked that he attend, and he did. Uh, at the time of his death, Zola had just completed a novel. It was entitled Verite, The Truth About the Dreyfus Trial, in which he was already working on the next novel entitled Justice, which he never completed. A 1953 investigation published in a popular French newspaper under the headline, Was Zola Assassinated? raised the idea that Zola's death might have been murder rather than an accident. It is based on the revelation by a chimney sweep that he intentionally blocked the chimney of Zola's apartment in Paris. The story was corroborated by Zola's granddaughter, who reported that her, great -grand her grandfather, Jacques-Emile Zola, Zola's son, told her in 1952 a man came to their house to give him information about his father's death. The man had been with a dying friend who had confessed to taking money to plug Emil Zola's chimney. And where his relationship with Jean was concerned, Alexandrine, his wife, uh, received an anonymous letter uh, <clears throat> before his death telling her that her husband had been leading a double life and that he had two children with Jean. The woman we see briefly in the film, Jean, the blood maid, Alexandrine went crazy when she received the letter. She went to Jean's house and was absolutely desperate and threatened her and Emile, but he somehow managed very cleverly 
to keep both women in his life. And after his death, Alexandrine went to see Jean and she proposed adopting the children so that the name Zola would go on. And that's exactly what happened. In November, 2022, that portrait that you will see at the end of the film, if you didn't see it yet, uh, was sold in, in 2022, 2022 uh, for $138 million, $138 million. Uh, one of the most expensive paintings ever sold, but that wasn't the last of Cezanne. Paul Cezanne's card plays, the painting was purchased for about 250 million by the country of Cater in 2011 holding the record until later on uh, for the highest sum ever paid for work of art. The card play is, is part of a series of oil paintings that Cezanne did in the final period of his life in the 1890s. Uh, it is so interesting and there is so much more you could learn uh, if you go on. Uh, even, you know, Ben Emil Zola became a photographer later in life. If you remember, he shows pictures to Cezanne that he took uh, because he was given a camera as a present and he began to explore photography, saying that this will replace art. He felt that that would replace art, uh, which nobody really believed, but he did because it captured life. It captured real life in black and white. Uh, so there you have the story of the film. You have some ancillary stories about the film. Uh, which uh, did very well in France, as you can imagine, but was a revelation for a lot of people who never really knew. Most people really didn't know this relationship uh, between the two artists. And it was great that Danielle Thompson took this upon herself to create and present to the world. So I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'm ready for you to dig in. And I expect you to dig in with some comments, questions, uh, about the film, about the artists, whatever. So who's going to go first? Do I see a hand? Ah, uh, Karen, I saw your hand sneaking yep. in there. <laughs> okay. Should I go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to say I really enjoyed the, the movie and uh, I felt it was a great learning experience just to learn about these um, artists and um, um, let's see, it was a little bit difficult to watch at times, I guess, because of the temperament of um, Suzanne. But um, all in all, um, and the, I loved the, uh, all the scenery. That was so beautiful. And um, basically that was it. I, <laughs> I liked it for all, all of it really. Terrific, terrific. Thank you, Karen. Who's next? Who's up next? Okay, Jackie. <laughs> 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 you rat. We, we <laughs> liked it. We liked it. We actually did some research afterwards and found out a lot of what you had said there. Um, the only problem that I had, to be honest with you, was I got a little confused twice. And, and one of it was somewhat continuing because several of the artists resembled each other. And so I had a little trouble keeping them separate. And then at the towards the very end, I couldn't tell until I looked it up if he had actually divorced Alexandrine and Mary Jean or if, if Jean was uh, his mistress. So, I mean, those were not really major issues, but I thought I agree with you. I think it was beautifully. The photography was tremendous. It really was. So yeah. I enjoyed it. But one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I don't know if anybody um, realized was I think it was he did like 2000 paintings in his lifetime, which I thought actually sounded like a lot considering how many he destroyed. He, he constantly was destroying paintings. So that surprised me. Yeah, apparently there are over 700 major works hanging around the world. There's a, you know, besides the private ones that we will never see. Uh, there are, are at least 700 uh, around the world. Uh, but, you know, it's funny you say that about how the artists and, and well, it was the fashion of the time. They all grew beards. They all grew beards. It was their fashion to grow beards. So they did become indistinguishable. Uh, they did begin to look alike and it was very hard to tell them apart. 
Uh, but they were, you know, it's interesting to see them sitting around in the cafe and arguing with one another. And, you know, the fact that it wasn't just fine artists, it was also writers like Zola, who were also involved in this, uh, in the conversation. I thought that was terrific. It shows you, you know, it's relevant today. I am sure that the artists all mingle, whether they're fine artists or writers, they all mingle in some way. Uh, so it's 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 interesting to see the changing times, but the fashion too. Thank you, uh, Marilyn, and then Linda. Um, I I really like this film a lot. I told I I told Shelley earlier I saw it and I what is it you I watched it and I saw it like I saw it twice because I was fascinated by it, and I really did not know most of it, the history. And the only thing that I did know was many, many years ago, I read a fascinating book called An Officer and a Gentleman. And yes. it was all about Emil Zola and how he had the balls, the guts, the whatever, that I would love some of the politicians in this country to read that book because he stood up against the president of France, the whole French government, and he defended Dreyfus against them. And that led to, Dre to Dreyfus's exoneration. So, I mean, it was like basically a footnote in this movie, which it should have been, but he was a major, major hero in this one. And if anybody wants to read a really great book, and it's called an officer and, and, and a spy. An yes, officer, officer and, spy. and a spy. And it, it is great. And it really tells you how really, I mean, Zola was prolific. I never read Nana. And I know that that is like his his book, but uh, maybe one day I will. But, and he was amazing. But the fact that he did that in my in, in my mind, I mean, he just rose to the top as as being such a wonderful person. Um, yes, he's a great friend. And to to Cezanne, I mean, Cezanne was so sensitive and so and I don't know, did he see himself as such a victim? He just couldn't really handle anybody not you know saying anything about him that he couldn't handle. So. Yeah, I'm not surprised he was bipolar or had any of that. He was his own worst enemy. And and Mil Zola was like the best friend he could have had, and he did. And it was a beautiful friendship. Yes, it was. And and I, I will tell you, thank you for bringing that up. You know, it is a note, it, it is a footnote in the film, as is most of Cezanne's art. We really don't see that much of it. Because the film, she she created the film to concentrate on the two men, is really their story, uh, and and not to the process of the art, the process of not to delve into that. She wanted to delve into this relationship because that's really what formed these two. But speaking about an officer and a spy, it was adapted into a motion picture in France. Uh, it was it was directed by Roman Polanski and it won the French Oscar a few years ago. It's it's uh, about the Dreyfus affair mm -hmm. and it really is a revelatory film. It's it's an all star an all star French cast in the film. Uh, it's not available in the United States, which I am really upset about putting everything else aside. It is an incredible work. Um, I know it's, I know there is a, a version with subtitles and I will try and get it at some point. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I am hoping that maybe somebody like Canopy might put it on at some point. We'll see. But, uh, it is, it is, it is, it is because of his work. And it was Jacques Hughes was the essay he wrote and he wrote it in a Catholic newspaper in Paris. And it was interesting because the newspaper put it in because they had originally several months before, there were a number of anti-Semitic articles that were published about Dreyfus, which did appear in the paper. And they wanted to retract these and Zola's essay wound up in that paper, which really made it even stronger. Uh, but yes, he, he was instrumental 
and and it's what's interesting is although it was overturned, he was not exonerated until much later. Until much oh, later. Till, till, yeah, till much later. Uh, but uh, they wouldn't overturn the the uh, the first guilty trial where he was found guilty. But later on, when all the other things came out about Estahazi and all of these people that were involved in this, uh, he he was essentially clear uh, thanks to Zola. Thanks to Zola, which is why they wanted to kill Zola and effectively did, effectively did. So thank you. Thank you for reminding me of all of that. Uh, Linda. Yes, uh, this movie was wonderful for me because um, it was an education. Cezanne, in my mind, painted fruit. <laughs> and <laughs> I knew nothing about his personality. And Zola, I knew as Marilyn did all about the Dreyfus affair. And um, the only thing is it was a little disturbing for me anyway, to see the relationship they had because it was a love-hate type of um, relationship mm. as far as I was concerned. And yes, I agree, um, Cezanne was sensitive, but not in his actions towards others. He was sensitive how they affected him. So um, I really liked that uh, movie. And the end, I did wait. And I loved the way the the mountain became the painting. It, ah, great. Yeah. yeah. It was beautiful. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, his, his work, I mean, the amount of uh, output that Zola had, uh, let alone Cezanne, both of them were prolific. Uh, and, and they were all, if you, you're really paying attention, they were young men during mm -hmm. most of this. They were young. It was it was in their thirties and forties that they were that they had been at the summit. Uh, well, at least Zola had been at the summit. Cezanne was really developing all these new movements in painting that nobody was paying attention to until later on. Uh, but uh, Zola, you know, he had written Anna. He had written, uh, I think, the the um, the he wrote about the communes in Paris. A uh, very popular novel. Uh, he wrote, I think it was the male animal. Uh, he he delved into very naturalistic stories about murder, about about he wanted to write about the common people. He wanted to write about the workers. He wanted to write about the poor. He wanted to write, you know, he wanted to dissect society. In a sense, he was uh, he inherited what Balzac started. Uh, and that's why he was considered as great as Balzac uh, in in the in the French letters within French letters. Anybody else? Somebody else? Come on, somebody's got to have something to say. Go ahead, Eileen. <laughs> you got to unmute yourself. Yes. Unmute. There All you right. go. Well, I'm always amazed at your knowledge. It's fascinating how much you know about everything. <laughs> I um, wish. <laughs> I, I didn't particularly like this film. I didn't oh. care that much. I wasn't affected by the characters and the people in my personal group. A lot of them felt the same way. For instance, Seraphine, you really cared about Seraphine. Um, I was put off by Cezanne's behavior and his treatment of Zola. And so... I didn't think it was a great movie. Anybody else agree with me? Or did everybody in this group like it? Audrey? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, Barbara. I liked it. I, I, You know, it is what it is. If that's the way that he was with Zola, that's what he is. What I loved about it is I'm familiar with his work and I saw in the movie, he'd be looking at something and you'd say, I remember that painting. I remember the painting of that mountain. I remember the painting of the woman with the with the low dress. Yeah. Uh, well, Listen, let me let me I, let me weigh in I, for a second. I, you, OK, let me weigh in for a second. I can understand you if you didn't like the film. I hope you didn't read any reviews of the film. That's the first thing. Is ah. is you can't read reviews and judge the film from reviews. You have to judge it from your own subjectivity. That's number right. one. 
Number two, nobody said that you're invited into the story to fall in love with these guys. Uh, it's essentially a story of, it's a story between these two men. And yes, they have their flaws. And that's what we're meant to look at. We're meant to see all the dimensions of them. Uh, even if we walk away saying, I didn't like Cezanne, nobody likes Cezanne. Okay, the truth is nobody liked him. He smelled, uh, he he never bathed, he was objectionable. He but the reason was, and they they surmised after his death, when you know they looked into medical records and everything else, and also his behavior, that he probably was because he was treated for depression a great deal, and they noticed his mood swings while he was alive, but there was no name for it. Uh, it wasn't until later, and that he was bipolar, uh, and it explained his. But it's it's the idea of what these two became, even even though they they you know you might not like them, you might not care for them. There is a distance naturally with from the within history from the in the film, but we get to know them as people. This is their formulative years, and that's what we're looking at. Uh, and I think it's interesting from that point of view, because people really never explored it from that point of view. And I think exploring it in the film was an interesting way to do it. Uh, there's no there's no story. There's no book that I know of written about the two of them. Uh, there certainly isn't a play, as we know. So this was a way of, of revealing to the French public, let alone the world, that these two men actually were friends and that they both came out of, uh, well, one of them really came out of obscurity to become a giant of literature while he lived. And the other became a giant after his death. Uh, and I think that's revealing in the film. And I thought the way as a story, it works. I think uh, filmically, it's beautifully shot. Uh, and uh, yeah. it captures the period for us. So I think, you know, you walk away from it saying, wow, I think I learned something, as some of the people did say. And I think that's really what's important to take away from the film. Uh, you know, is is uh, that's the way I feel about it. And I think some of you feel that way. But it's it's to me, I thought it was it was really a good work about artists. You know, most of the time when we see a film about an artist, especially a film like Seraphine, we see their process. We get into their process. Yes, we feel for Seraphine because of who she was, and she was unknown. Uh, and and uh, but most films, you know, whether it be Lust for Life, whether it be you know about Jackson Pollock, we're seeing their process, we're seeing their art, we're seeing them, you know, involved only in their art. Whereas here, it's not about the art really per se it's not about the literature because we don't it's it goes by mentioning it's about two men it's about two men and the impact they had on each other uh and how they were able to survive because of each other uh and maybe we're inspired by each other i mean that line that Cezanne says you know i wish i could paint like you write it says volumes about a man uh and how he felt about zola and Zola to say at the end, he was a stillborn genius uh, because of all his troubles, you know, what he could have been in his life. And little did Zola know what he would become after his death. So that's interesting. It's ironic that we hear these lines and think about it afterwards, I think is, is important to see, important to tell. So that's why I, I really enjoyed the film. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, so that's, that's why, and I will tell you, you know, my rule is you have to see a movie more than once. You only watch it the first time you will see it the second time. Uh, you really will be able to delve into certain scenes and see it. And I think that's important, uh, to see a film more than once. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's my explanation. I'm sticking to it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Uh, Jackie. Well, I was going to say that going to Eileen's comment, that actually tells you what a great film it was, though, is that it evoked a strong emotion in her, whether you like it or you don't like it. If you're just kind of neutral, it's not much of a movie. But if you've got uh -huh. a strong emotion, it it's a good movie. So that worked for her then in that. That's that's a that's an interesting response. I I kind of I I tend to agree because 
if you think about it, why didn't I like it? And you start to, you know, parse all of that. You realize that the film affected you in some way. If you stuck with it all the way through, you know, it's some people would walk out in the middle of the film. And I don't like that because they're not giving it a chance. Uh, and, and, and also a way of really, you know, and I'm not talking about every film. I'm talking about these kinds of films. Uh, it does challenge us as, as it did you, Jackie, challenge us to go and investigate more. You know, it's like NBC used to say after a teleplay, after a television a movie, they would say, now read all about it. You know, go to your library, you know, read about the story. So I think that's what's important. That's that's terrific. Uh, Dora? Um, yes. Uh, I thought the, the movie was very exceptional. I never, because I, it, 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 I learned a lot about the two artists. I knew about uh, Zizan a lot, and especially that I knew that he painted that mountain. Maybe that was part of his, it was an obsession with him to paint that, that mountain every time with different color blending and all that. And, and I knew that he was, a, yeah, troubled. But I, I, so I knew also about Zola, but never knew that they had a relationship like, like it shows. And so I think that's part of what we learn. And, but the, at the end of the film, it said when Zola died, that uh, Cezanne cried for, for the days because it really, he really loved that. It, it was a real love among two friends. They were really, really, really good friends, but but at the end it was the the maybe because Zola was very successful and Cezanne not, and this was maybe one of the reasons that they fell apart. That maybe Cezanne was jealous of of uh, Zola. I I don't know. But but yeah, well, this is this is a natural feeling of among artists, you know. When also when when he visited all the other artists that were, uh, in, and he said, "I I don't like the impressionist." Uh, yes, but because he he did not know how, he did not like to paint as a, as an impressionist. But but then he uh, he ended up uh, painting a plein air. So that, that was part of the, the impression is also that they mm -hmm. painted like that. So, okay, I love that movie. I thought it was very, very touching, very, um, thank you for presenting it to us. Uh, well, thank you. But it's, it's also, I wanna get back, you know, to Eileen for a second. Uh, the, the, the fact that I talk about, you know, when you read criticism, of a film, especially film critics, uh, because it's, it's you know, they have an agenda uh, and you're reading their agenda. Now, if they don't like a film uh, for certain reasons, they may be looking at it for certain reasons. They, you know, because they, what they do, they tend to do is write their own film. Uh, when they're, they're, well, the filmmaker didn't do this and didn't do that, it left me here, I, why didn't he do that? Well, the reason is they don't know what the filmmaker was doing. They don't know what was left on the cutting room floor. They don't know, you know, exactly what goes into the whole product. They know it goes into the process, but they're not commenting on that. They're commenting, you know, to their audience and why they think their audience uh, might not like the film. Uh, and, and I understand that. But I I find my the back of my hair going up sometimes when I read criticisms of film. And then you read criticisms of film that they're laudatory about and you go to see them and you go, so what? Uh, so it's, you know, critics, critics, be careful with critics is what I always say. And don't read criticism till after you see the film. Form your own opinion, then read criticism. Uh, because if you read it before, they're going to, they're going to, sort of put you in a box they're gonna they're gonna paint your feelings about the film 
uh, you're going to think about them when you see the film. So don't read criticism before. I hate the fact that they publish all this criticism when the film first comes out uh, because people look at it and say, well, maybe I'll go see it. Uh, you know, be be your own judge. Be your own judge is what's important. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Nobody else. Well, okay. Uh, thank you. I mean, this was stimulating. I appreciate all your comments. Believe me, uh, it's it's important to understand. And and just as Jackie said, whether you like it or not. You have something to say, and it it, it affected you in some way. Uh, so next month, we go into a new theme. The theme is the searchers, the searchers. We take two journeys across the worlds, across worlds and cultures, uh, and stories of people finding their place in the world. Uh, and the first one is a beautiful film. It's entitled Shun Li and the Poet. Shun Li and the Poet. Uh, it's a uh, it features stunning performances, uh, beautiful cinematography, I will tell you. And it is a touching, touching story highlighting that between Shun Li, who works in a textile fa textile factory near Rome and slowly paying off the broker that brought her from China. Uh, it is the sort of railway in, into Europe for Chinese workers at the time uh, and brings it to Italy. And while saving money so she can bring her young son to join her, she is suddenly transferred to work as a barmaid, as a bartender in a pub in a small town in the uh, Venetian Lagoon outside of Venice, uh, where she meets where she meets a man known as the poet, uh, who is also an emigre, as you'll learn. Uh, the two of them strike up a friendship, uh, and it is uh, a beautiful alliance of two cultures uh, that are alike, yet withstand the treatment they undergo uh, within this Italian town. So uh, it's, uh, I look forward to going over that film. It is an award-winning film, and it features two wonderful actors, who I will tell you about then. So I will see you in two weeks. That's all that's look yes, forward to. Everybody, April 10th. Yes, and again, it's on Canopy. Uh, it's also available on other streaming services. And as I always say, go to justwatch.com, and it will tell you where the film is available. Justwatch.com. Yes. Yes, uh, I went into JustWatch.com and I saw a movie that it was from 19, 1997 or something like that, that it was recommended. So it, that's great. That's great. Yes, it is. It's Thank a wonderful you. website. I use it all the time. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you, yes. Shelly. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you yes. all for joining us. See you again on April 10th and happy Easter. Yes, yes. Happy Easter to those rolling eggs, and uh, <laughs> I will see you soon. I okay. will see you soon. Take care. Thank you.